Yes, thank you. I'm here. Great, thank you. I see that all the board members are here, so we'll get started. My name is Kevin Mullen, chair of the board, and I'm calling mm -hmm. this meeting of the, the board to order. And the first item on the agenda will be the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. I wanted to announce that yesterday our federal all payer model partners released the first evaluation report for the model. On, this is on performance years one and two, which are 2018 and 2019. The report was prepared by a team of researchers from NORC at the University of Chicago. While the quantitative results focus on the Vermont Medicare population, the report also includes all peer findings, especially in the qualitative results. The report summary and technical appendices are posted on the Vermont APM page on CMMI's website, as well as on the Green Mountain Care Board website, and you can find that under our federal, federal reports section. Just a, a brief summary of the findings. Uh, the report shows statistically significant Medicare spending and utilization reductions, both for the Medicare ACO program and for the full Vermont Medicare fee-for-service population relative to a comparison group. I want to note here that this is not in comparison to past Vermont performance. The report methodology compares Vermont to a comparison group rather than to Vermont baseline performance. Additionally, similar to AHS's implementation improvement plan re, re, uh, that was produced, I guess, last year, I can't remember, I think earlier this year, um, the report highlights that the Medicare ACO model poses some barriers to critical access hospital participation. Qualitative findings include improved cohesion around shared goals and collaboration across the state payers and providers. And the report also found spillover effects to the full Vermont population, noting that some of the ACO and hospitals population health initiatives are payer blind and serve ACO and non ACO beneficiaries alike. And that Vermont has a long history of investment in primary care and population health, a statewide culture of reform and a strong regulator in the Green Mountain Care Board. I'd uh, recommend that folks take a look at the report either on the CMMI website or on our website. And if you have any difficulty finding that, reach out to me or to Abigail. I uh, wanna also announce we have ongoing public comment uh, through today on the FY22 hospital budgets. Uh, as Chair Mullen has mentioned previously, we accept public comment uh, 365 days a year, but we encourage folks to submit their public comments so that they can be considered by the board. Uh, lastly, we are conducting ongoing public comment for a potential next all payer model agreement with our federal partners. All of those comments will be shared with our uh, colleagues over at AHS and at the governor's office as they are leading the negotiations on a potential next agreement. And that is all I have to report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, August 11th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, August 11th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show the motion passed unanimously. And now we'll, we'll turn ourselves over to the business of the day, which is hospital budgets. And I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Patrick Rooney. Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me know when you can see the slide deck, please. We can. All right, and Joanne, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Very good. Please feel free to interrupt at any time and tell me to stop mumbling if that's the case, and I'll be happy to adjust my. Um, well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> good morning, board good member. Good morning, members of the public and stakeholders. Um, 
Board Member Yusufer, are you ready? Yes. All right. Once more under the breach then for Maureen. Uh, for those of you who didn't think Shakespeare could be a part of hospital budgets, here we are. Um, <clears throat> so September 1st, hard to believe. Uh, this is day one of the deliberative session as part of this regulatory process. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to be working from a slightly updated slide deck from what we posted and what we sent to board members. The changes are very, very minor. Uh, one being on slide three, we received a public comment last night, so I updated that number from nine to ten. On slide five, the final bullet point uh, says non Medicare advances. It should be not Medicare, not including Medicare advances. On slide 12, the FPP as a percentage of NPR FPP, the title says FY21. That is obviously incorrect. It's FY22. And finally, on slide 50, Rutland's decision, it says 9.2% growth is within budget guidance. Obviously, that is not correct. It is in excess of. So the latter I'm three. I'm sorry, I'm Patrick. Patrick, I'm yeah. sorry, it's Joanne. You, you cut out there. Could you do the last one, please? Slide uh, 15. Certainly. Slide 50, 5 0. Uh, Thank you. Says, you certainly says 9.2% growth for Rutland's NPR budget to budget is within guidance. It is not, it is in excess of uh, those last three being the fact that we've become snow blind to this uh, massive slide deck by looking at it almost every day over the last month. So we've made those corrections and you will see those in the presentation today. Uh, to recap the hospital budget schedule, this process formally began on July 1st. Uh, as submissions were received from the hospitals. Uh, and on July 28th, the staff here did a preliminary budget review and offered up uh, Gifford Medical Center and Northwestern Medical Center for exemptions from review, meeting a separate uh, set of guidance that the board set out uh, back in March. Throughout the weeks of August 16th and 23rd, we heard from the remaining 12 hospitals who were not exempt from those hearings. And as I've stated, here we are today, September 1st, day one of deliberations, and we have additional deliberative dates set for September 3rd, 8th, 13th, and 15th. By the 15th, the board has to have votes completed for the uh, 14 Vermont hospitals. And over the next two weeks uh, following that, the staff and legal counsel will work to draft orders for delivery by October 1st of 2021. So the order of operations today, we're going to be we're going to review um, how we got to this point, the public comment piece and system slides that cash, capture the system perspective in the aggregate across multiple data points. We'll stop on slide 33 uh, to kind of codify um, Gifford and Northwest Medical Center's budgets for motioning and official approval as part of the deliberative process. I'll turn it over to our counsel, Russ McCracken, at that time to uh, work the board through that. Uh, once the system review is complete, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair, for any board discussion or questions that uh, need to occur. And then time permitting, uh, with how close we might be to a bio break or lunchtime, uh, the staff will then go through each of the remaining 12 hospitals in this slide deck and just recap for you what we've heard so far through the financial component, the narrative, and the budget hearings, and the information we've captured through those for each hospital with the information that we have to date. Um, <clears throat> once that is complete, we will go back to the first hospital in the slide deck, and we'll begin offering recommendations for the board to uh, deliberate on and potentially offer a vote. We are prepared to do that for six hospitals today, uh, time permitting, of course, and that's how we'll navigate through this slide deck today. Uh, deliberation and public comment. As I noted, we've received 10 public comments to date. Uh, that includes three that were mentioned in the preliminary budget review presentation on July 28th. The public comment period for fiscal year 2022 budgets was officially opened after that presentation on July 28th and will close today, September 1st, 2021. However, Green Mountain Care Board will accept public comment at any time on a variety of issues. So if you'd like to make that uh, public comment, and we encourage you to do so as part of this transparent process, we have a link here at the bottom of the page that will take you to the Green Mountain Care Board website where you can submit your public comment for the board's review. Some staff considerations for this budget uh, as we went through all of the processes that uh, we've been through over the last 60 days. 
Uh, we've looked at the adequacy of the NPR and FPP growth rate requests with allowances for COVID-19 vaccine and testing revenues as set out in the guidance. The hospital's overall financial health, including operating margins and key financial indicators and the overall impact of COVID thus far. Potential financial uncertainty due to COVID-19, hospital capital and infrastructure needs. We've heard from several hospitals that projects that have been postponed for the last year and a half are beginning to ramp up again uh, as the need to complete those and get them started uh, is becoming more necessary uh, due to things like patient backlog <clears throat> and aging uh, physical plant. Participation in the all payer model and delivery system reform efforts, the impact of change in charge on commercial rate payers, provider transfer and accounting adjustments, and how those fit into those NPR requests and the justifications, hospital specific risks and opportunities, utilization components, and cost savings initiatives. Continuing on, um, some other considerations uh, that we wanted to bring before the board today. Um, we've heard from hospitals how challenging it's been to produce budgets for fiscal year 21 and for fiscal year 22, which also makes your uh, decision making capacity challenged as well. Um, the creation of these budgets um, and the way we regulate them does not occur in a vacuum. It certainly passes through to you, the board members. So we wanted to outline some of the items for you that we've heard from hospitals over the last uh, couple of budget cycles, and that is uh, the first bullet point here. Fiscal year 21 budgets were extremely difficult to create with COVID's impact on 20 actual results, which in many cases is causing the budget to budget growth that we're seeing here in 2022 on a hospital by hospital basis to fluctuate pretty wildly. Uh, hospitals did their best last year, they did their best this year, and there's so many unknowns that some of that NPR growth that we're seeing uh, seems pretty high uh, on a budget to budget basis. Fiscal year 22 budgets were no different, um, have also been very difficult to create due to COVID-19's impact on the first two fiscal quarters of activity, which uh, for those listening at home would be October 1 to December 31st, and then January 1st to March 31st, where um, from a public health perspective, we descended back into that COVID black hole uh, in late 2020, early 2021 calendar year and also the impact on the 2020 actual results with the cessation of uh, elective non-emergent procedures uh, making these but the basis for these budgets extremely challenging we've also heard about how projections remain extremely in nature changing on a month-to-month -month basis with the rise of covid 19 variants slowing vaccine administration the ebbs and flows of utilization that almost directly correspond to those covid variants uh, and vaccine administration as we know it today. So what is today? We may not know tomorrow uh, type of scenario. <clears throat> and also the remaining COVID relief fund balances, not including Medicare advances and PPP loans are susceptible to federal government guidance and time frame changes. We had a lot of the same conversations this year that we did last year around provider relief funds and what is on your financial statements. What are you going to use at this time last year? Those provider relief funds from the CARES Act were use it or lose it by 1231.20. Well, that changed as we descended, the nation descended back into um, a very serious period for the pandemic in late calendar year 20 and early 21 before vaccines became uh, commonplace. And also the PPP loans, it doesn't feel like we're in any better place today to understand if those will be forgiven or they will have to be paid back. From what we heard from hospitals, we're looking at maybe deep into fiscal year 22 or early 23 before there's clarity on that. The one item here that we have a better understanding of is that Medicare advanced fundings are undergoing reclamation by CMS as we speak, beginning in April of 2021. So we just wanted to outline some of those items uh, and some of the challenges that we considered when looking at some of these hospitals and hearing from them over the last two weeks. Some common budgeting themes. You've seen this slide before in the July 28th presentation, so I'm not going to go through it point by point. We did add one bullet at the very bottom from uh, that we heard from several hospitals around the staffing challenges that they're seeing, especially with recruitment. There are socioeconomic challenges in this state that are leading and and inhibiting the ability to recruit. Uh, oftentimes, when people move here, uh, it's it's very much a family decision to do so and therefore finding uh, accessible, uh, accessible and affordable childcare, finding housing, and some of those other matters 
are, uh, are apparently inhibiting our hospital's ability to successfully recruit folks from out of state to move to Vermont and uh, take up their life's work here uh, as a healthcare provider. <clears throat> On slide seven, we have the system wide income statement for budgets as submitted. You can see here uh, net patient revenue and fixed perspective payments are coming in just shy of $3 billion. That is the 6.4% increase over the 2021 budgets that were approved. Uh, total operating revenues are growing by 6.7% over 21 budget. That includes specialty pharmacy, 340B, and those other operating revenues. Operating expenses are pushing uh, just shy of $3.2 billion or a 6% budget to budget increase which is resulting in a net operating income or operating margin in dollars of 76 and a half million. Uh, when we factor in non-operating revenue, we have a bit of a complexity there this year. Uh, for budget 22 as submitted, we're looking at ne negative 7.5 million. So when you add that to the operating margin to get your total margin in dollars or excess of revenue over expenses, the system is, is as submitted would like to produce $69 million in revenue. <clears throat> which produces an operating margin percentage of 2.3% and a total margin of 2.1%. Change in charges, you can see here on slide eight, the very bottom right hand corner, uh, estimated weighted average for all hospitals is 6%. Uh, the highest uh, numerically is Springfield at 8.3% request and the lowest is Mount of Scutney at 2.2% for their charge request increase. Um, obviously from a weighted average perspective, um, the University of Medical Center 7.1% is driving that 6% number up over the rest of the system. <clears throat> Another slide you're familiar with from past uh, presentations, specifically the preliminary slide, is the five year average and five year median for change in charges from 2017 to 2021. Uh, the five year average, Northwestern Medical Center, tops out the hospitals at 4.88, and Porter. Uh, is at the bottom at 0%. For the five year median, Mount Escutney uh, is at the top at 4.6%, and Porter again is at 0%. Porter has not requested an increase in their gross charges over the last five years. That's why they are at 0.0%. Instead, they have followed the UVM Health Network hospitals on their past uh, uh, approvals for commercial effective rates. So at the bottom there, you can see that Porter has uh, an applied percentage. Uh, growth for commercial effective rate. Uh, net patient revenue in more detail than the system wide version that we just showed you. This is on a hospital by hospital and compiling that into the aggregate again uh, here on slide 10 on the far right hand side. You can see each hospital's uh, proportion as submitted to the Green Mountain Care Board, uh, bringing uh, net patient revenues for the system up to just shy of $3 billion. <clears throat> Uh, which is about a $300 million, or sorry, a $200 million increase over the 2.78 uh, that was approved for 2021. <clears throat> uh, to put that into perspective here, we have the net patient revenue percentage growth. So from 21 budget to 22 budget, the straight average for the system is 6.4% growth. Uh, when we adjust the 22 budget for COVID vaccines and uh, testing revenues, the 21 budget to 22 adjusted budget, uh, straight average drops to 6% from 6.4. And we applied in co a compound annual growth rate off of 2019 uh, to smooth out some of the fluctuations that the COVID pandemic has caused with MPR and FPP. And it produces with budgets as submitted a 4.7% annual growth off of 2019. Fiscal year 2022 fixed perspective payments and their proportion of fixed perspective payment to total MPR FPP. Uh, total system just over 409 million. Uh, economies of scale here are very important. The University of Medical Center uh, producing $182.3 million of that 409 million. Uh, the system average coming in, or the system total coming in just short of 14%. FPP to total MPR FPP, uh, but leading the way uh, within an individual hospital would be Southwest Medical Center at just shy of 24% fixed perspective payment of their total $178 million in NPR FPP. 
total operating revenues, which is NPR FPP plus other other operating revenues such as especially pharmacy and 340B are just shy of 3.3 billion as submitted to the Green Map Care Board. Uh, I will continue to reiterate this here. It's the economies of scale factor. Uh, UVM Medical Center being the uh, flagship of the network and the, the tertiary care center in Vermont is going to carry more than 50% of that in any given year. And on the other side of that is uh, Grace Cottage coming in just shy of 24 million in total operating revenues as submitted. COVID-19 funds reported to the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, fiscal year 2020 actuals, uh, we'll see $191.2 million. You'll note in 2021 budget, uh, per the discussion we had a couple slides ago, that at this time last year, hospitals were not sure if they were going to be able to justify and therefore recognize the use of some of those CARES Act funds and other uh, relief funding that uh, the, the United States taxpayer has funded uh, to support their health care system. And then you can see here in reality, what's being projected is a very different story, uh, which reflects the changes in guidance that have occurred over the last year. And I'm sure from what we've heard from hospitals, though uh, as it relates to how they account for it those guidance changes have occurred more frequently than even what we're giving credit to here uh, but you can see um, heading into the 22 budget there's not much expectation that there will be more relief funding coming at this point in time whether or not that actually materializes uh, i don't think any of us can say right now but you can see here that for the system in 2021 projection, it's coming in just shy of $107 million that has been realized and taken in by these hospitals. Uh, and of course, we heard from some hospitals concerns that some of that money may have to go back. Uh, I don't think we can weigh in on that now. Um, we'll just have to wait and see with that what occurs with that um, <clears throat> with the guidance as it relates to being able to justify those funds. Other operating revenue, again, another slide that uh, board members and those who follow these processes are familiar with. On the left-hand side here on slide 15, we're showing the growth of other operating revenues in terms of dollars uh, for the system. So here in 2022, on the right-hand side of that left graph, we're looking at about $297 million in other operating revenue. You can see shaded in a different type of blue uh, where hospitals reported their uh, provider relief funding over the last two fiscal cycles um, is driving those numbers up uh, to 400 and over $450 million respectively for 21 and 2020. Uh, and on the right hand side for fiscal year 22, you can see a breakout of the drivers of other operating revenue and specialty pharmacy and 340B uh, pharmacy programs, no surprise, are carrying the weight of that $297 million for fiscal year 2022. Operating expenses uh, system wide coming up just shy of two, $3.2 billion with again, the medical center carrying over 50% of that uh, total dollar figure and Grace Cottage coming in on the uh, small side of that at $24.5 million uh, with a very <laughs> diverse bag of um, expected operating expenses occurring uh, between those two bookends of the medical center and Grace Cottage. Again, providing some perspective with the growth, uh, 21 budget, 22 budget, we're looking at a system-wide straight average of 6% growth budget to budget. Um, Northwestern Medical Center is reporting the smallest amount of growth, actually less growth, uh, headed in a negative direction, uh, with Copley Hospital uh, showing 12.8% growth budget to budget. When we adjust for expenses for COVID vaccine and testing cost, the system straight average drops to 5.7%. Northwestern's actually reduces to almost a full percentage point and Copley's stays on the high end at 12.8. And of course, as with revenues, COVID has had a major impact on uh, operating expenses, which have fluctuated uh, pretty significantly. So we applied a compound annual growth rate to smooth out some of that activity from 2019 to 2022. So on a system wide uh, average, it's been 4% annual growth. Uh, from 2019 and you can see each hospital's <coughs> uh, figure there uh, for your edification. Operating margins, we often see uh, here on slide 18, we often see during budget time a lot of black, um, but as the year progressive progresses with some hospitals, uh, 
those budgets don't quite work out and expenses exceed uh, revenues. Uh, for the projections so far, uh, not too bad on the whole. Again, I don't want to overstate that hospitals are in excellent shape uh, as we are still in the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> But there's a lot less red on there for the projection for fiscal year end. And I'm sure some of these numbers are going to change by year end. So again, not wanting to overstate that, but the system as submitted to us uh, back in July is looking about at about a $69.5 million operating gain. Uh, for the budget 22, $76.5 million is what has been submitted to the board. Uh, and again, the medical center in Burlington, just shy of 51 and a half. For an, for an operating margin and Grace Cottage, who historically budgets for either break even or a loss, um, budgeting almost a $900,000 loss, uh, but for the support of their <clears throat> very generous community, they usually end up on the positive side for total margin. Margin percentages, applying some context to those big dollar amounts that we see at some hospitals. Uh, System-wide, the straight average is 2.3% for operating margin. And although UVM is looking at 51 and a half million, it equates to about a 3% margin as submitted to the board. Uh, Grace Cottage, their $900,000 uh, budgeted operating loss is just shy of a negative 4% operating margin. And as you can see, we have several hospitals within that 1% to 2% range as submitted. Uh, Gifford Medical Center being the high end, just shy of 6%, with Porter Medical Center coming in uh, just behind them at 5.1%. Total margin, or what we call below the line, when you take your operating margin and add your non-operating revenue to arrive at your total margin. We can see here some pretty diverse activity on slide 20 uh, for fiscal year 2022 budget. We heard from Southwest about the uh, budgeted $45.6 million uh, total million dollar loss that they are anticipating. This is not a cash loss. It is them going through the appropriate accounting needs to um, facilitate the shift of their pension obligation off of their balance sheet. Um, <clears throat> the liability that goes with it is being seen here, um, but it is not that Southwestern Vermont is in dire straits by any means. Uh, and on the other end of that, we have $72.5 million uh, planned by the University of Medical Center. So when we take all of this and add up uh, that very uh, differentiating activity between Southwest Vermont and everything and Vermont Medical Center and everything in between, we arrive at just north of $69 million for total operating margin as submitted for fiscal year 2022. Again, providing some context around those dollar figures, um, Southwest Vermont uh, coming in just shy of a negative 34% total margin as budgeted. Uh, on the high end here, we have Gifford Medical Center at 7.4%, uh, system-wide average of 2.1%, and just to continue highlighting the medical center here, 4.2% operating margin. Total margin, excuse me. <clears throat> uh, the next set of slides are slides that you've seen before, so I will move uh, relatively quickly through them. Nothing here has changed since the preliminary presentation about a month ago, uh, but I will run through the logic here as it relates to um, some of these <coughs> uh, financial comparisons that we're doing. Uh, on the left-hand side here, you'll see we've grouped the critical access hospitals together. And from that, you can see for operating margin, the median margin for fiscal year 2022 as submitted is 2%. So that is represented by the blue line that you can see on slide 22. Uh, and continuing with past practice, we're using the flex monitoring financial reporting um, for critical access hospitals, which we have found very, very useful in the past. We're continuing to use that here for hospital budgets to provide perspective to some of the numbers that have been submitted or planned for 2022. Uh, so we broke it out uh, geographically for Northeast critical access hospitals for 2019. And I should speak to that 2019 piece because it seems like a lifetime ago at this point, but many of our hospitals this year are using 2019 as their uh, demarcation point for 2022 budgets as that was the last year of pre-pandemic or normal normalized activity. Uh, so we feel comfortable using 2019 uh, financial measures to compare our hospitals to. But we broke it out into geographic uh, footprints here with the Northeast, represented by the red line there, coming in at about 1.7, 1.8% operating margin, and U.S. critical access hospitals altogether across the 50 states 
coming in under 1%. So you can see relative to the United States, our hospitals are budgeting for uh, operating margins that exceed that US median. Um, again, like we said in the presentation, these are not meant to be targets. The situation around the country can uh, change uh, pretty wildly, uh, depending on which region of the nation you're in. And when all told, um, those margins are coming in just under 1%. So that's why we feel justified in taking the Northeast. The Northeast uh, traditionally operates for the most part uh, relative to each other across several states. Uh, so we feel that that's a pretty good measurement. And as you can see where our hospital's median falls, it's very, very close to that Northeast median for critical access hospitals. And then you can see each hospital's individual budgeted operating margin for fiscal year 2022. On the right hand side of slide 22, uh, again, we took the Vermont median for PPS hospitals, those prospective payment system hospitals. The median is coming in just shy of 1.5. Again, the Vermont median being represented by the blue vertical line on the graph. And then you'll see each of the uh, six hospitals that fall under some sort of PPS designation um, <clears throat> and comparing them to some Fitch rating solutions uh, uh, comparisons that we've selected again sticking with that geographic footprint um, we took northern new england uh, new hampshire massachusetts and maine and hospitals that operate within that footprint that uh, fitch rating solutions which is one of the major uh, three major rating bond rating companies in the world uh, along with moody's and s p and then we took the northeast which expands that geographic footprint to pennsylvania new jersey connecticut new york uh, to gain a little greater understanding of what's occurring in the northeastern quadrant of the United States. Uh, and you can see that Vermont's hospitals for 2022 are planning to uh, beat those medians um, <clears throat> in general. Um, but we do want to say one thing about the, the Fitch piece. This is our first year using them. Um, it's been very, very informative. We feel very comforted in the fact that we're using a geographic footprint. We know that throughout that geographic footprint, the operational and financial diversity that exists within that most likely reflects the operational and financial diversity that we're seeing in the state of Vermont. And so we're not targeting a specific bond rating grade because of that. If we did that, certain hospitals would look very, very good and the rest would look not so good. And we don't feel that that's uh, from a regulatory perspective uh, to add context that that would be the appropriate way to look at this. We also need to remember that bond ratings are a measurement of risk so that those folks who are looking to lend money and those folks who are looking to borrow money uh, will have an accurate assessment of how risky that lending is going to be and what to charge in an interest rate. Bond rating uh, is, your, is, is very similar to your personal credit score. If your credit score is very, very low, if people lend to you at all, they're going to charge you a premium. And so you're going to pay more on that debt that you are <clears throat> borrowing from them so that they can reserve to cover the potential loss if you don't pay and make some profit off of you. But if your credit score is very, very high, uh, people will be uh, extending credit to you hand over fist for the most part. So it's an assurance measurement. Also, Fitch, when they do these analyses, they incorporate things that we don't. So when they're looking at assessing an organization who may have a bond rating. And I think in this case, the UVM Health Network uh, is the only organization that has a bond rating in the state, to my knowledge. Um, <clears throat> when they're looking at that, they're applying many, many more uh, inputs than we are for this regulatory process. So just to be fair to the rest of the hospitals who are in this coverage here, that's not how we're looking at it. We're, we're taking the geographic footprint and the financial comparables that exist within that and benchmarking those hospitals or the hospital system against that as a whole. So just to clarify that, we feel good about this approach with the geographic footprint, capturing that diversity and not, um, not making any hospital look better or worse um, based on that. Moving on, the next few slides are some of the, uh, the financial metrics that you've seen thus far. So we cover, we just covered operating margins. We have total margin percentage here, and you can see how things shape up. Obviously here on slide 23 for PPS hospitals, Southwest Vermont is the outlier uh, with the accounting uh, methodology that they're following to shift that pension obligation. We have our note right there in the slide for the folks following along at home. Uh, slide 24, days cash on hand. You can see using the logic we've just discussed for critical access and PPS hospitals, 
and the rating systems that we've brought into this. You can see where each one of those hospitals falls along with the median for that uh, data point for 2022 budgets for days cash on hand in this instance. Slide 25, days receivable. Uh, for the most part, our hospitals are doing a very good job of uh, collecting what's owed to them uh, at a very rapid pace compared to the uh, metrics we have here, which does not surprise uh, those of us who work with these hospitals and we know uh, the uh, conservative nature of the financial leadership at the organizations in Vermont and usually in northern New England as a whole. Um, they want to make sure that when they send those claims out, they have the documentation, they are buttoned up, and there will be no um, uh, kickbacks or denials of those claims uh, in which you have to start all over again. So we can see that our hospitals do a pretty good job of collecting the money that's due to them. Days payable. Days payable is uh, is is much more inclined uh, to be to shift uh, all over the place on an organ organization to organization basis based on how management uh, views their cash flow situation. But for the most part here, uh, our hospitals do a good job of paying their bills on time. Certainly uh, scenarios like uh, COVID will could shift uh, how, how management decides to pay their bills, what bills they decide to pay, whom they decide to pay, and when they decide to pay uh, based on what the cash flow uh, situation looks like. Uh, but for the most part, our hospitals are in pretty good shape. Um, flex monitoring does not carry this as a metric. I think if I read it correctly, they use a 12 month rolling average on a hospital by hospital basis. Uh, so they don't capture it uh, from a median perspective across the uh, the geographic footprints that we've selected from them for the Northeast and the United States. Long term debt, uh, how how much debt do these organizations uh, carry to replace assets? Um, <clears throat> we can see for the most part that um, compared to their their peers, they are relatively low. Um, however, we heard the medical center say that they've carried uh, they're carrying more debt than they would like to. Um, that's why they would like to uh, produce an operating margin to use more cash in doing so, so that they can lower that number. Uh, but as you can see here, the Northeast uh, Fitch comparison is north of 30 percent. I believe it's around 35 percent. So UVM is still 10% under that geographic footprint uh, peer group for um, the Northeast, and they're just under it for Northern New England, which again is New Hampshire, Maine, and Massachusetts. <clears throat> Debt service coverage, um, how much of their uh, liabilities do they can they cover uh, with the assets that they have here? Um, 4 .6, or the cash flow that they have here, so for every dollar in liabilities that they carry, we can see the critical access median here is $4.64 per dollar of debt service that they have to cover. Um, and for PPS hospitals, they have $3.32 for every dollar of debt service that they owe annually on their liabilities. <clears throat> Age of plant, uh, we heard over and over again throughout the budget hearings the last couple of weeks that Vermont's hospitals average age of plant uh, is very high. Uh, as we stated in our presentation, this is not surprising. Our hospitals in the state uh, tend to get the most out of their assets, um, but that can't go on forever. Eventually, investments have to be made to replace assets or construct new assets um, for the organization to continue to carry out its mission. Uh, so we can see here that for the most part, Vermont hospitals exceed their uh, peer groups, uh, both from critical access and PPS perspective. And we have some hospitals here whose age of plant is is really getting up uh, in years and is going to require some significant investment in the years to come. And we heard that time and time again throughout the process. A lot of that is due to delays over the last year and a half and not uh, not carrying out some of those plans. But uh, speaking from the CON perspective, we have heard and we'll see several CONs uh, coming in to the Green Mountain Care Board for review if they have not already arrived. Shifting to ACO plan participation, we can see here that the Medicaid plan, uh, program, uh, with the exception of Grace Cottage, is universal across Vermont's hospitals. Uh, we did hear from Grace that in the coming year, they're going to explore the possibility of participating in Medicaid. Medicare continues to be somewhat of a mixed bag. Um, critical access hospitals that are associated with the Medicare program generally have uh, some sort of system affiliation uh, that comes with that. 
And as we heard from Executive Director Barrett, the new, newest report uh, says that there are some challenges uh, with the model as it currently exists now, as it relates to critical access hospitals participating. Uh, we do have several hospitals participating in some sort of commercial uh, program with the ACO. We didn't go into uh, detail on this, but if they are involved in um, some type of commercial uh, payment reform, we did mark them down as a participant. And then we have a few hospitals here, the network and health network and Rutland who participate in self-insured program. So total monthly average budgeted attributed lies for calendar year 2022. You can see the, the program groups here, Medicaid, Medicare, commercial and self-insured uh, with the Medicaid program having the most uh, average budgeted attributed lives. Uh, this is for, again, calendar year 2022. Uh, so January 1 through December 31 of next year. <clears throat> And then shifting over um, as we near the end of our system review here, we had two hospitals who were uh, approved for exemption from public hearing on the July 8th, 2021 uh, presentation and board meeting, and that was Gifford Medical Center and Northwestern Medical Center. Uh, underneath those titles here on slide 32, you can see the qualifications that they had to meet uh, for exemption. They met those with their uh, fiscal year 2022 budgets and therefore were exempted from having to come before the board over the last two weeks uh, and have their budget meeting uh, on a public forum. <clears throat> with that, I'm going to turn it over to our general counsel, a uh, member of our team, Russ McCracken, uh, to discuss with the board uh, suggested motion language for these two organizations to officially uh, accept those um, fiscal year 2022 budgets. This is a deliberative process. As you know, we'll be going through votes on the remaining hospitals. So to capture that for the record uh, in this deliberative process, um, we have some motion language here for the board. So with that, Russ, I'll turn it over to you quickly to uh, navigate the board through this slide. Uh, great, thanks, Patrick. This is uh, Russ McCracken. I'm a staff attorney with the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, and as, as Patrick noted, uh, the board did find in, it, in its July 28th meeting that both Gifford Medical Center and Northwestern Medical Center met the requirements to be exempted from the public budget hearing because uh, those hospitals, um, uh, as noted on the previous slide, met all the requirements uh, that were set out in the board's uh, budget guidance for, for FY22 um, for that exemption requirement. Uh, the board voted to exempt Gifford and Northwestern from public hearings at that meeting and said their budgets will be approved as submitted. Um, at the risk of some redundancy here, we recommend specifically approving the budgets uh, for Gifford and Northwestern. Um, as you'll see in the proposed language here, um, we've uh, and it's language that will look familiar uh, as you go through the rest of the hospitals. Um, it specifically approves their budgets as submitted uh, with the yeah, NPR increase, the charge increase, and subject to the standard budget conditions outlined on, on the next slide, on slide 34. Um, so in thinking through this a little bit more, it may be uh, prudent for the board to take a look at those conditions on slide 34. Uh, and I'm happy to to walk through those as well, um, unless Patrick, you would like to. Um, to make sure that these are the standard budget conditions that the, that the board is um, comfortable with, they're based largely on uh, the budget order conditions that were included last year. Um, for the FY uh, 21 uh, budget orders. The, these are kind of the baseline conditions. Of course, the board could make specific conditions um, to specific hospitals if the situation um, warranted, warranted that. Uh, but just to walk through these quickly, there's a monthly reporting requirement for FY 22 year-to-date operating performance. That would begin November 20th and uh, done as in coordination with board staff. There are uh, telephonic check-ins 
to be scheduled at the discretion of Chair Mullen in consultation with the staff. Uh, and that's based on, on the hospital's upcoming year-to-date operating performance. Notification to the board of any revenue and expense assumptions uh, that underlie the hospital budgets that materially change. Um, filing information necessary for the board to review uh, each hospital's FY22 operating results includes audited financials. Um, that would be as instructed by uh, board staff. Ask that all hospitals timely uh, file all provider acquisition transfers and other uh, material accounting adjustments as instructed by the staff. And that's also uh, set out in a little bit more detail in the FY22 uh, hospital guidance. Uh, the hospital would continue to file all requested data and other information in a timely and accurate manner. And if flagged in particular, including updates on access to care and wait times, um, given the ongoing uh, challenges that, uh, that uh, Vermont is facing in, in that regard. And then asking that uh, the hospitals participate in the board's strategic uh, sustainability planning. Um, so I'd welcome any uh, comments, or, uh, suggestion, or, or discussion on those. And uh, also, uh, as Patrick has moved back to the suggested motion language for Gifford and Northwestern. Uh, I guess I'll turn it back to you, uh, you Mr. Chair, if that uh, process is OK. Thank you, Russ. Um, do any board members have any comments or questions about the uh, um, the standard conditions. Kevin, I, I have a quick question. I wanted to float an idea, but I'm not sure it belongs here. So I'm open to suggestions from other board members and our legal team. Um, but it's potentially floating the idea of adding another condition that relates to uh, the potentially avoidable utilization. I think that you know, as we're all trying to increase access and reduce costs and improve quality, I think we really need to make sure that hospitals are thinking about ways to reduce that avoidable utilization, particularly in the ED and particularly in our inpatient settings. That'll free up resources, right, for those who really need hospital and emergent care most. It's going to help reduce costs and it ultimately will help our population health. So I'm wondering if we wanted to add a condition to all hospitals um, to develop strategies to reduce that potentially avoidable utilization so we know that they're tracking it, understanding it, and developing strategies to work with their community partners to try and prevent some of that utilization and improve population health. So I'm not sure if it belongs here, but I, I thought I'd throw out that idea. Are you suggesting any type of reporting for that, Jess? Um, well, I think what I'm trying to do is probably telegraph that I would like to see it in the budget guidance for next year is some, you know, I want to incorporate some measures of it or some, uh, you know, um, assessment of it. But I think knowing right now that it may be difficult for them to collect the data and we'd have to figure out if Mathematica can continue to do this uh, data analytics for us. Uh, I just want to ensure that they're thinking about it as they're developing their budgets for next year and as they're we're already into fiscal year 22 that they're already thinking about reducing some of that uh, potentially avoidable utilization. So I'm not sure whether I'm actually asking them to report on it or just to be developing those strategies that we would hope to see in next year's budget. So, but I welcome other board member feedback on this topic. I'm not sure exactly how to do this. I just don't want it to be forgotten and I want it to be considered as we're going through fiscal year 22. If we wait until fiscal year uh, 23 budget guidance, we're already a year behind. Other comments from the board on uh, uh, Member Holmes' suggestion? Well, my, my sense of, of it is that uh, it might not be ready for prime time uh, in a very tactical, detailed sense, but I know that Jess was very thorough in discussing with hospitals during the hearing process about that study that came out about, um, you know, a, a avoidable um, uh, services that and and it profiles Vermont's hospitals in, in specific. And so, you know, if if the if the condition could be such that, 
you know, points toward that opportunity um, that that uh, report uh, raised and asks mm -hmm. hospitals to kind of provide a report or a discussion um, um, around that uh, as part of the budget process. That makes sense to me. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't. It doesn't make sense to go for me to go too far beyond that because it's just not as well developed in areas I think it needs to be to be um, a standard budget condition with, with any teeth in it. But on the other hand, I, 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 I agree with Jess, I don't want to lose a year in terms of, uh, of hospitals knowing that that's something that's on the table and we would like them to think about it. Other thoughts? I think it makes sense for for hospitals to start thinking about it. It's consistent, quite frankly, with what their communities are doing or attempting to do with the care coordination and the ACO programs. So it's really tying together the community efforts and the hospital efforts in, in a sort of a, a way of measuring how, potentially measuring how well or poorly the community is achieving their goals um, in care coordination, since it seemed like a lot of those measures are really determining whether the upstream, you know, the the community efforts are successful in keeping people out of the hospital. So, um, so I like the idea of having folks starting to think about it. We also had several hospitals talk about st strategic planning initiatives. So it would be timely for those hospitals to be thinking about it in that context as well. Um, but I agree, you know, certainly we're still in the middle of a pandemic. People may have operational challenges. We know they have staffing challenges. So I think we need to be sensitive um, to, to those sorts of environmental conditions, which understandably, quite frankly, mean that some of the care coordination and efforts on population health are going to be less successful because of the you know all of the covid um kind of problems and and issues that are arising so i think um just a suggestion of doing you know sort of a signaling condition that is not meant to have strong teeth or um require specific operational changes, but, you know, kind of say, um, you know, folks should be thinking about this and be prepared that in the next year's budget cycle, they're going to be asked about it. I, I'm not sure exactly how to word the condition, but I think our staff could work on that. Well, I, I think it's uh, difficult to uh, approve the budgets with standard uh, conditions if we haven't uh, hashed out those standard conditions. So. Um, so could we, so would it make sense then for Jess and legal to put their heads together and have a standard condition to propose for Friday that also gives quite frankly, stakeholders time to weigh in if they have, uh, you know, ideas and then we could add that on Friday and move forward. Oh, yeah, because we're meeting Friday. Yeah, um, with these two, because unless they believe they could do it uh, over the uh, lunch recess today, that's so a good that thought. Please get some of these low-hanging fruit uh, um, approved. Yeah, I think I. I yeah, I think let me try and work with legal over our lunch break. I'd like to, you know, move forward with the the budgets to approve today. I don't want to stop that. Um, I just wanted some language in there that suggests that this is important to consider, and we hope that they're building some strategies to reduce some of this avoidable utilization. That's all I'm really asking for here. So I think we can work on that. Okay. So we won't take any uh, action on the uh, motions at this time. Um, those two hospitals should not be concerned that they don't have approved budgets. It, it was an oversight in some of the wording of the uh, motion during the previous vote, but they will be uh, voted on, um, if not today, on Friday. And um, so nobody should try to read more into this than, than what's there. And 
hopefully Jess and the legal team can come up with uh, the final uh, condition over the lunch break. So with that, Patrick, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So that concludes uh, our system review. And as stated, I know we're kind of playing pass back and forth here, but I will turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair, for any discussion on the system view that we've discussed. This Getting some pretty strong feedback. Jess, yes. it seems to be coming from yours. I'm not sure. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> and um, does anyone uh, uh, wish to offer any uh, comments at this time about the uh, system view? Any board member? I have a, a couple. Um, la I didn't see it in, in this slide deck, um, but last year there was a slide that showed kind of the new money that um, the NPR FFP growth, the new money, um, and uh, the you know, percent of that new money as distributed acro across uh, the hospitals. And I remember to me that was kind of a striking table in that it showed that uh, that that the new money um, uh, in the 2021 budget relative to uh, the 2020 budget, I think, was um, a 3.3 percent increase. But when you took UVM Medical Center out of it, it was a four tenths of one percent increase. And I just think that that's a that's a table that is helpful to uh, follow the money uh, rather than. You know, I, we could do it with the inform, or I could do it with the information that's presented here, but it would just take quite a bit of time to uh, go through all all the the netting calculations. And then there is the issue of it, you know what would it be relative to? Would it be relative to the 2021 budget um, or relative to the 21 uh, projected budget? But um, to me, that is a table that I, I would like to see and have have part of the record. Uh, so that uh, as a board member, but also the public can follow where the money goes. Here's the new money um, and here's where it went. Um, and then the second one uh, would be a, um, and, and I think of this in the context of the cost shift, um, a table that profiles the new money by payer. So uh, we would take the the, the new uh, 2022 additional NPR that's on that uh, and you know first uh, slide that that Lori Lori did um, and profiles where that money is coming from by payer because I think the story is probably one that um, would uh, paint the picture of how uh, debilitating the um, cost shift is uh, in terms of pushing. Uh, these new additional resources onto the commercial payers as opposed to um, uh, Medicare, Medicaid. And, and this is through the eyes of the hospitals. This is in their presentations of payer mix. Um, when you go through those, you see a lot of hospitals just don't have any, a, a, any uh, anticipation that that uh, the payer mix for Medicaid, uh, that, that the amount of money coming from Medicaid will increase by any substantial amount. And I just think that's a fundamental structural story. Uh, if true, and I believe it's true, looking at past records, that, that, that we should be focused on. So th those, are, those are two tables, one that I know that we did last year, um, and, and another that I, I would uh, ask the, the staff to consider. I, I don't think either of them are hard to do, but I think they're very informative. Other members of the board? Um, yeah, first I, I wanna really thank the staff for, for putting together the, this comprehensive overview. And I think it really helps to set the stage for you know, the discussions that we're gonna have. Um, you know, I too, I think there's one other table um, that would be helpful, and I, I have all the information, you know, as I'm going through, so I, I can pull that together for myself. But um, really, the cash balances, I, I know in the appendix there is something, but it's really just the 21 budget projection and then 22. 
And I think it's important to look at the day's cash on hand um, going back to pre-pandemic to where we are now, because that um, certainly is a critical metric. And, you know, we can use all the a lot of averages to look at operating margins and things like that. But, you know, one of the things at the end of the day is is where's where's our cash and what's the, you know, fortunately, many of the hospitals, if not most, are in a much better cash position, uh, even taking into consideration um, where they may need to, you know, giving back obviously Medicare Advance and, you know, where they think they're going to net out between, um, you know, whether they have to repay any COVID money back, you know, so their 22 budgets certainly consider that. And, um, you know, I know that is going to be something I'm going to look at and weigh in on um, as we make decisions. Um, because, um, you know, this we know the pandemic um, has certainly taken a toll on the hospitals, um, on you know everywhere, on, on society, everything. But when we do look at some of these hospitals, the money that they were able to receive um, has certainly put them in a stronger position on their balance sheet. So um, that would be a good table maybe to have as a reference. Certainly, you know, we all have it in our backup, but um, you know, I, I think that would be one one to look at, but thank you for all the comprehensive work. Any other comments from the board? If not, I'm going to suggest that we take a break till 10.05, give Jess and the legal team some time to uh, do some work. Um, Patrick and his team can huddle. And we'll come back at uh, 10.05. Hopefully at that point we can approve the conditions and uh, go back to the two that uh, we just have to do a redundancy vote on and then proceed uh, from there. Is there any objection to that uh, suggestion? Sounds good. Okay, with that, uh, this uh, meeting is in recess until 10.05. Okay, it's now 10.05. I'm going to reconvene the board meeting and ask uh, um, Member Holmes if you have had success with the legal team. Yes, we have. I think uh, we have some language that I think Patrick added to a slide. There we go. So the language as it reads, uh, and thank you to the legal team for helping me and, and Robin actually for helping wordsmith this, but Hospital review, will review the data and information in the Mathematica report regarding potentially avoidable utilization in their ED and inpatient settings, and hospitals will work with board staff to potentially include these measures in non-financial reporting as part of the fiscal year 23 hospital budget review process with the goal of developing strategies to reduce potentially avoidable utilization. So I'm comfortable with this language. Um, I think it's suggestive of this is something that the board, I, if everybody agrees, would like to continue to look at, understand more. We'd like hospital input in how we might incorporate these measures in our non-financial reporting process. And at the end of the day, I really feel strongly that reducing this potentially avoidable utilization has real potential to impact patient health outcomes and reduce costs. And I really want to focus on this. So this allows us to start to focus on this for the upcoming year. And Patrick, are the other one, two, three, four, five, six, seven conditions identical to what we talked about earlier? Yes, the only change is in that final uh, bullet point, which has been added per the work of uh, board member Holmes and the legal team. Okay, um, board discussion. Works for me. Yeah, Would somebody well. like to make a motion before I turned it over to uh, public comment? Sorry, Maureen, I may have cut into you. Oh, no, I said it works for me as well. Thanks. Okay. Would somebody like to make a motion? I will move that we adopt the standard budget order conditions on slide 34 uh, to be included in each hospital's budget order. I'll second it. <laughs> And one more thing I should have asked uh, uh, to begin this. Um, Joanne, are you there and copying all this? Yes, I am. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, at this point, I'm going to open it up to public discussion on the motion that's in front of us to adopt the standard budget uh, order conditions as seen on slide 34. Is there any member of the public who wishes to comment at this time? Is there any member of the public that wishes to comment at this time? I see that both Jeff and Mike are on from Vaz and they're not making any comments, so I'm assuming that there is an objection to this change. Although you know what happens when I assume. Um, but with that, um, is there any further board discussion on the motion? If not, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. Patrick, if you could back up a slide. And would someone like to make um, these motions at this time? I will move to approve Gifford Medical Center's budget as submitted with a 3.5 increase from fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 22 budgeted NPR FPP, a 3.5% increase to overall charges uh, subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined on slide 34. Second. It's been moved and seconded to uh, approve Gifford Medical Center's budget as outlined in the language on slide 33. Is there any discussion by board members? Yeah, I have just one question. I mean, I, I um, when you go back to the minutes of uh, July 28th, uh, the language in Robin's motion was that, uh, um, and I think I have it here exactly, it was, was to approve basically their budget. And I understand. Yeah. And so uh, Tom, I this is just to... uh, for redundancy, and that's because the motion did not include the um, charge and um, um, net patient revenue language. And right. so the no, no, team I, is recommending that. I understand. I understand that, uh, uh, Kevin. I'm just want to. I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm just asking the question whether or not Gifford and Northwestern you know, have been notified about this because, uh, you know, and don't have any problem with it. It is redundant and it's it's more technical in nature than substantive or totally technical in nature than substantive. But I just want to make sure this doesn't uh, become a surprise to them or muddy the water with them. Because I think they left the July 28th meeting thinking it, it was done. I think we all left that meeting thinking it was done, but I think we have to follow legal's advice and uh, make sure that the motions are properly out there. And this is consistent with what they submitted. There's no change. Um, it doesn't doesn't change anything for them. Um, so, but again, before we uh, um, take a vote, we'll open it up for public comment in case anybody wishes to say anything. But you're right, it is a little bit unfair because they may not even be tuned in. But I don't think it does anything different than what we did last time. No, I, I agree with that. So at this point, I'll open it up for public discussion. Does any member of the public wish to speak on the motion in front of us um, related to Gifford Medical Center? Hearing none, is there any further board discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, um, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that it was, it was a unanimous vote. Is there a second motion? 
I move to approve Northwestern Medical Center's budget as submitted with a 2% increase from fiscal year 2021 to fiscal year 22 budgeted NPR FPP, a 3% increase in overall charges subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined on slide 34. Is there a second? Second. second. It's been moved and seconded to approve Northwestern Medical Center's budget as uh, outlined in the motion on slide 33. Is there any board discussion? If not, we'll open it up for public comment. Does any member of the public wish to um, comment on the motion in front of us regarding Northwestern Medical Center's budget? Is there any further board discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that it was unanimous vote. And Patrick, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> So as I stated before the break, that rounds out our system perspective. And as discussed at the beginning of this presentation, uh, the next step for the team here is that uh, Kate, Lori, and I are going to navigate through each one of the 12 hospitals that we've heard over the last two weeks, recapping what it is we've heard, what their requests are as submitted. Um, <clears throat> and then once we're done with that stage, uh, obviously, uh, considering the timing, whether it's around lunch or what have you, uh, we will then move into um, back to Southwest here, the first slide in the slide deck, and we'll begin to go through making recommendations for board discussion and potential vote. So I'm gonna kick this off uh, with Southwest uh, for our uh, hospital by hospital review here. Uh, and I'm doing so primarily because there's a few different perspectives that we've added this year over prior uh, budget deliberation review periods and even fiscal year end periods, uh, keeping with that narrative that I discussed at the preliminary review where we're trying to take some of the data points that we already collect and be more creative or even illustrative of some of the numbers. We understand that not everyone is a numbers person. We have a lot of numbers that we collect, which is probably an understatement. So finding new ways to provide uh, some imagery around what that would look like, but also the challenges that we just discussed earlier in budgeting with COVID are also challenges for the board in making decisions. So how can we help facilitate their decision uh, primarily around items like reasonableness? It's very, very difficult to assess reasonableness under normal circumstances. It's even more difficult to assess reasonableness, uh, reasonableness in the current state of things that we've experienced over the last two fiscal cycles here as it relates to our regulatory processes. So we'll start with Southwestern Vermont and I'll give you an overlay of what you can expect to see in all of the subsequent slides related to each one of these hospitals. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Patrick, there's some background noise and I'm, I'm, I lost you after after what you what you can expect to see in all of this. OK, yes, I'm, somebody got muted. I will reiterate safe travels to whoever is getting in their car. Um, so what you can expect to see uh, is primarily what um, I'm going to show you here on Southwest with the layout. Uh, each hospital has been catered to the information provided and what we've heard or read in the narrative and in the uh, hospital budget hearings. So I'll start off here with Southwest. <clears throat> uh, they are running 1.4% uh, for their projected uh, FY21 over what they had budgeted. Uh, they were relatively conservative in their fiscal year 21 budget with all of the unknowns. So you can see here at the top left on slide 35, uh, the numbers that go along with that 1.4% variance with their projection uh, at, as of the time of submission at just shy of 169,500. Uh, they're looking to grow 6.3% over their fiscal year 21 budget, which would put their NPR FPP at just north of 177.5 million. Uh, the request for 22 is 4.8% growth over the projection of 169.5. So in, a, in addition to that, they are requesting a 4% overall 
increase in their charge master, which is coming from commercial revenues of $4 million. That is the NPR impact of that uh, charge master request. Uh, and you'll see here on the left hand side a graph that we have not shown before. Uh, we heard from a couple of hospitals or several hospitals that 19, 2019 is kind of where they're looking to get back to from an operational and financial perspective, uh, all things being relative that that is the last pre pandemic or quote unquote normalized uh, state of operations and finance. So we heard some hospitals talk about how they looked at it and trending 3.5% NPR growth off of that period. And the, the reason they did, they chose 3.5% is that the board has approved in their hospital budget guidance, maximum growth ceiling of 3.5% each year for the past several cycles, which would cover fiscal year 20, 21, and 2022. So if we trend 3.5% off of that, you'll see that orange line beginning in 2019, rising up and covering the periods of 2021 and 22, and arriving for the Southwest at about $181.8 million. So said another way, if with all things in, um, if things had been relatively normal and Southwest had grown at that 3.5% rate approved by the board, their revenue for 2022 would be at or near $181.8 million. And this is how, in the discussions we've had internally, like how do we contextualize and kind of smooth out all of the fluctuations we've these hospitals have experienced and saying if we come off of 2019 we look at 3.5 percent growth as approved by the board where would they end up and this is another assessment of kind of the reasonability piece and trying to make sense of everything that's happened as we've talked about already the difficulty in budgeting and the difficulty in projecting and whatnot that has gone into the last few cycles in addition to that <clears throat> you'll note these black I bars right here coming off of each fiscal year from that orange line. So the staff wanted to reinforce that reasonability piece uh, by adding a plus one or minus one off of that 3.5% growth. So said another way, if you take that orange bar and you raise it up to the cap of that I bar, that would represent trending 4.5% growth. If you take that orange line and you lower it to the base of that I bar, that would trend 2.5% growth. So when we look at these budgets, a variation off of the 3.5 in some instances can be very, very significant. So we're trying to say, where are they coming in? Even if we were to lower that to trending 2.5, do they come in underneath that? Even if we raise it to 4.5, are they coming in over that? Are they coming in right on point? So again, trying to assess that reasonability in, in circumstances where reasonability has gone almost out the window uh, as it relates to the actual operations and budgeting here. So we've taken their 2019 and 2020 actuals with the blue line and then showed where their budget 21 uh, was going to come in and where they're looking to go for 2022. So and we've also added in their current projection uh, from the time that they submitted. So we can see here the green line differs from the blue line from projection to budget. That gap right there, <clears throat> looking at 2021, is the 1.4% you see at the top left. So you can tell that they have um, they are running over their budget as uh, approved by the board in 2021. And where they're looking to go is still going to come up more than 1% short of that 3.5% trending at the 181.8. So even with um some pretty good budget to budget growth at 6.3 percent and 4.8 percent over that 169.5 projection they're still coming in short of where they would have if we consider that 3.5 percent trend moving forward and you're going to see this for every single hospital the exact same layout these <clears throat> these are actually called error bars in excel we're using them for a different purpose here uh which is to gauge um some reasonability off of that 3.5 percent so these are going to fluctuate in size in accordance with the graph, and that's entirely due to the numbers over here in the vertical axis. So whether they're smaller or larger, don't be worried about that. We set them at plus one and minus one off of that 3.5% trend line, that orange line for each one. Uh, so don't let the optics uh, get in the way of the logic that's being applied to this graph. <clears throat> so moving along, we heard from the hospital 
through their submitted materials and hearings that this is a continued recovery budget as of submission. They were very conservative in fiscal year 21's budget with all of the unknowns uh, coming out of the first stage of the pandemic. Their budget to budget NPR growth after COVID allowances is 5.7. As you can see up in the yellow, it's 6.3 before we consider those. So of that 5.7, 3%, as they've stated, is from a rate contribution and 2.7 is from a volume contribution. Their operating expense growth budget to budget is 3.65%. They normally target a 3% operating margin. However, in fiscal year 22, that margin is being targeted at 2%. They do expect volumes to be higher in their organization in the coming year over 2021, especially in their primary care practices. Uh, for cost controls, their cost mitigation, they're looking to engage an outside or third party to review their cost centers for efficiency potential, and they are actively engaged in patient, uh, payment reform efforts here in Vermont, uh, primarily through the ACO. As we noted in our uh, preliminary budget review back in July, we provided a system wide review uh, that looked a lot like this using these waterfall graphs. And we said we would do that for each hospital to break down how they're reconciling from budget 21 to budget 22. And we put these in a descending to ascending order so you can see the suppressing factors on NPR and then the contributing factors to NPR. So on the left hand side, you will always see the largest suppressor of revenue in this instance. They have identified it as shift from fee for service all the way up to the utilization factor that's contributing and helping them reconcile or bridge from 2021 to 2022. So we can see here in ascending order rate effect contributes 4 million FPP contributes almost five and utilization returns contribute almost 5.4 as they work their way up to that one point. Uh, seven, seven million dollars <clears throat> or one hundred and seventy seven million dollars. We provided the same uh, view for operating expenses so that the board can see the various drivers or where um, efforts such as cost savings are coming into play uh, and other factors here. As you can see, um, reduced drugs, uh, drug use is coming is helping suppress operating expenses. Um, however, we see this uh, incline here where inflationary increases at 3.5 million are really driving uh, operating expenses up to the $180.8 million that they have uh, budgeted for 2022 as submitted to the board. This is a slightly different look than what you've seen in the past. It is um, the exact same information. However, in the past, what we would have had to do to provide a quarterly uh, perspective on NPR and operating margin uh, for this slide would be to take 14 hospitals, nine months of Excel spreadsheets, grouping them into three month clusters to represent fiscal quarters, and then having to manual continue the manual work to uh, extract that information, graph it and put it in here. However, as many board members know and folks at home may not know, earlier this year we shifted our reporting to a quarterly format in a uh, IT program known as Tableau. And so we've been capturing this information on a quarterly basis all along. We set parameters uh, in Tableau and then pull in uh, these Excel spreadsheets and it pre-populates based on what we've told it to populate. So for this slide here, we saved an immense amount of staff time this year uh, compiling this look for the 12 hospitals you're going to see in this slide deck because we are already capturing it and it may look a little different but it's still capturing the quarterly NPR in the middle there in the white numbers you'll see the change from prior period and then at the bottom you'll see the contribution to margin each quarter and at the top in percentages what the uh, operating margin percentage is so again our switch to this platform uh, saved a lot of staff time. Uh, we were able to produce this very, very quickly uh, instead of having to go through that very manual process. So you're gonna see this uh, in future presentations as we build out our history in Tableau, you can expect to see more images uh, coming out of that platform for use in our presentations around uh, hospital finance as we <coughs> begin to build our expertise in that. And a huge thank you to our teammate Kate Hoffman, who's really taken this on 
for anyone who wants to view uh, year to date activity uh, around that Tableau platform, I encourage you to do so. It's on the Green Mountain Care Board website under hospital budgets, fiscal year 21 actuals. We have three windows there that capture each fiscal quarter as submitted to us by the hospitals. It is an interactive platform, so you can change the data points and see how it affects each individual hospital and how those hospitals are faring year to date. Uh, so that's one change that uh, we have in this slide deck for this year. Slightly different imagery, same uh, data capture. So Southwest here, we can see that um, here's their year over year uh, view of budget to actual results for NPR and their operating margins. Uh, we can see uh, from the blue actual bar to the gray budget bar that uh, uh, Southwest has a, a long history of very accurate budgeting. Um, that includes fiscal year 21. Uh, to be fair, uh, with all the complications that came out of that, they are coming in almost right on budget, a little over, um, <clears throat> which is uh, excellent given the uh, conditions that we have. And we also have here tracking the percentage change from year to year. So going over to the left hand side here, 2017 was a 0.4% change over 2016. So that 152.6 is a 0.4% change over the 151.9. And moving left to right, you can see 2018, a 5.6% change in NPR, the 161.1 over the 152.6 uh, in 2017. So you can see the changes <coughs> uh, year to year in the history of Southwest. So as they've submitted their budget, um, they're looking for a 4.8% increase off of that 21 year end projection which would take their NPR to 177.6 million. And down below in the operating margin, as previously stated, they target about a 3% on uh, any given year. You can see here that oftentimes they come in slightly over or slightly under it. So some pretty good operating margin performance uh, when compared to that 3% 3 per, 3 target. And for fiscal year 2022, they're dropping their expectation to 2%, which has a value of $3.6 million in operating margin. This is the annual snapshot we give you, capturing uh, the impact of that 4.8% request uh, as it relates to Southwest. The NPR impact of that is $4 million. 1% of that request um, equates to $840,318 of that impact. They are applying it to their service categories of inpatient and outpatient gross charges, uh, nothing for professional services. By payer, you can see that that $4 million NPR impact is completely attributed to commercial revenues. And of the change from budget to budget of $10.5 million, their charge of uh, $4 million makes up the majority of that shift. And at the very bottom, we can see uh, tracking over the last five years what they've submitted for a request and what they've been approved at. Uh, Five-year average, very little variance, 0.2% from the 3.3% submitted to the 3.1% approved by the board. On slide 41 here, we've built out um, the data point on the left, the gross to net revenue collection rates. Uh, this is something that we've provided the last, at least the last cycle, maybe the last two cycles. It was a, a, a graph that can be helpful but we didn't feel was maximizing its potential so we were just capturing the all-payer gross to net which in uh southwest's uh, case here would be 43 percent going into uh budget year 2022 but when we started looking at that and asking ourselves questions how does this graph help inform and educate it wasn't really providing us with the answers that we wanted so when you think about that 43 percent well what's driving so we wanted to break that out by payer so you could see what they collect gross to net off of each payer after deductions from revenue like bad debt, free care, contractual allowances, et cetera. So here you can see that in 2022, uh, Southwest anticipates collecting of their gross revenues 70%. So their net patient revenues from, from commercial payers, they will get 70 cents on the dollar uh, <coughs> as it relates to this year's budget. For the government payers, they're relatively close. They expect to collect 27% of gross revenues in Medicaid and 32% in Medicare. So averaging all out, 
you can see the trend here uh, at 47 percent at its peak in 2018. Uh, coming down to 43% for all payers in 2022. And we put that alongside the payer mix to help, again, provide more perspective. Their payer mix is favorable to commercial. It's not the highest in the state. It's not the lowest in the state. Uh, but you can see here the history there is pretty stable for this hospital uh, across these major payers. And then again, going back to that left-hand side, you can see from that uh, payer mix what they anticipate on collecting in net revenues. So we've done that for each of the 12 hospitals you'll see here today. And then for each slide, I'm not going to go through all of this now because we're going to come back to this for uh, recommendations and discussion. Uh, familiar layout here. Uh, we've had uh, Russ provide the motion language, but I will uh, touch on this real quickly here before we get to the vote piece. What you're seeing here in the highlights are areas that uh, might require a change of language. So I'll speak hypothetically here and, and say that I have uh, no capacity to make a motion. So I'm just reading this uh, for uh, the board's edification, but you might read this as move to approve Southwestern Vermont Medical Center's budget as submitted with a 6.3% increase from 21 to 22, budgeted NPR, a 4.8% increase to overall charges, and subject to the standard budget conditions outlined in 34. That's if you want to accept it as approved. If you don't, you would pick up um, the as modified hereby. You would alter the highlight over the percentage increase, and then you would say with commensurate reductions to operating expense growth in the aggregate in order to protect margins, and then you would select your new figure for the overall charge increase. Um, so you don't have to read the whole paragraph. You just have to cater it to whatever the scenario calls for. If you want to take it as submitted, it simplifies things. If you want to alter it, then you'll read from some of those bracketed areas um, that are also highlighted. <clears throat> so that concludes uh, Southwestern Vermont Medical Center's uh, hospital review. I'm going to turn it over to Kate Hoffman to uh, perform a review of Rutland Regional Medical Center. Kate, Patrick, um, might I interject at this point? Um, rather than go all the way through every hospital and then come back, there may be some hospitals at which um, we're ready to make decisions and rather than repeat the uh, information and actually while it's still fresh in our minds so that we um, readily remember it, I'm just curious if uh, it might make some sense if any board member was given some time at the um, end of each one to begin the conversation. We are amenable to that, certainly. So yeah, if you I could think that makes up. sense, Kevin. And also, I think um, because this is the first through one hospital, um, maybe talking about you know any comments we might have about the presentation format, you know, because that's going to be the same for each hospital. So not specific to to Southwest, because um, I do have a couple comments. Sure, let's um, let's back up to Southwest. And Maureen, you can take it away. Yeah, so my comments are not going to be about any approval piece. It's just going to be about the format. Um, if you can go back to slide 41. Um, you know, this was one of the things the, the left hand side of this chart was one of the metrics we were really trying to get, you know, at least from a comparison for all the hospitals. And so what would be helpful is if you could convert that ratio to Medicare. So um, this is where we would take the 69, if I'm looking way over on the last bars. So, so Medicare um, reimburses at 32%. And then if we benchmark that to what is commercial relative to Medicare, it's 2.1% or 2.1 times. And then similarly, if we look at um, Medicaid to Medicare, um, you know, this at least helps us. It's, it's one comparison point across all the hospitals just to say, you know, how, how are they looking against Medicare, right? Some are pretty close to Medicare, some are double Medicare. Um, 
you know, it, it goes a bit with the, I think, with some of the healthcare advocates' questions that did not get answered completely. So without that, you know, this is one of the benchmarks that I am looking at. So um, do you understand what I'm asking for, Patrick, or looking at? Yes, I do. OK, I, I just think, you know, relative, it, you know, it is something, to, you know, if we're trying to say how, how are their commercial prices relative, at least we can benchmark it to something. And I know it's not, you know, apples to apples, all services aren't the same, et cetera. But, you know, at some point when you're crossing hundreds of millions of dollars worth of revenue, um, you know, there is some relevance to look at how it's how it is as a comparison. Um, and then if you back up to um, page 40, and, and um, th this, this might be fine, I just have a question on, you know, do they have professional services that are at a zero? So is there NPR there? Because if so, then the overall change in charge would be lower. Um, and that's the way it is on other hospitals. So on other hospitals, there might be an inpatient charge of five, an outpatient charge of five, nothing on professionals. So their overall change in charge was was lower. Um, and, and maybe they don't have any professional there, but I'm just trying to get, um, because when I do look at some of the other hospitals, there is a difference there. So maybe you can talk about the calculation there or um, if you understand what I'm saying. I do understand what you're saying. The calculation there is not done by the staff. It is done by the hospital. So we're simply projecting um, <clears throat> what they offered up. Uh, and when I look at their uh, tab two of their appendices here, they apply 0% to professional services and 0% to other. And so what they list out is uh, charge master increases of $21.5 million overall and a 4.8% charge master increase um, and 4.8% for both of those inpatient and outpatient service lines. Okay, because I'm concerned there might be some inconsistencies when we look at, some, at how the hospitals did this because some hospitals, again, will say they had six in inpatient, six in outpatient, zero in professional, and therefore they were a, a four, for instance, for their overall change in charge. So, um, you know, it, do we know that they did, so their inpatient is 4.8 for sure, it's not six, six and zero getting to 4.8. Um, they have listed 4.8 for each of those. Um, okay. The key to that may be in their narrative. They may have outlined that they don't have any professional service increases this year, um, but we took this straight out of the appendices and applied it to this table as they supplied it to us. Okay, it'll be just something I may point out as we go through some of them because some of the hospitals do have a different number for their overall change in charge versus these categories. And if we're um, relying on what the hospitals gave us, there might be some interpretation differences in how that's done. So um, I like looking at what by service category what it is and and so we will see in some hospitals a larger service category charge than the overall change in charge so um just just something to look at there um i think that's it you know i mean what i had talked about before but obviously um we're not going to have time to change it before we look at each of these which is you know really understanding where their cash balance changes have been um so when I talk about certain hospitals, I will look at that as a reference, but clearly we don't have a table that shows that, you know, for each of these hospitals, but um, maybe you guys can at least be ready with what, what they are if we have a question on, you know, what their day's cash on hand is in 2019, 2021, and the 22 budget. Um, and that, that's all I had on format. I'm, I'm really just talking format here. Okay. Any comments from other board members on Southwestern Vermont Medical Center? Uh, 
I would so I would chime in and say I like um, the graph that you included with the three and a half percent from 19 because I think that is for me at least very helpful to think about kind of holding a steady course over time and um, and um, you know trying to figure out how to deal with uh, the various ups and downs related to COVID which do make this more challenging. Um, the, I, I guess I had two, a question that I wanted to ask for people to, to think about, about, you know, normally we include the language in the motion that if we cut the NPR, that the hospital will cut the expenses to reflect it in order to, um, preserve the margin, um, I'm wondering if given this, the staffing and expense situation this year and the ongoing uncertainty related to the pandemic, we would wanna give more flexibility to the hospitals. Not that I want them to budget for a negative margin, but um, you know, if we know that, that there are these COVID related pressures, um, would it give them more flexibility on that? So th that's just a question that I wanted to ask um, to get other people's opinions about in terms of uh, that part of the decision. So I'll give you some quick feedback, uh, Robin, in that um, there were there were at least one um, hospital where um, I think a change in charge may be um, necessary, at least in my view, that's just one person. Um, but I was thinking along the same lines as you that I'm not so sure that um, given all the uncertainties with the pent up demand, if changing NPR um, makes sense in that particular case. But um, I think we can have those discussions as we go through uh, on each of the, the hospitals. Yeah, I was ex explicitly asking for, I mean, I, I appreciate that and I and that makes sense to me, Kevin. I was also asking about the expense because if, if I'm not sure who's driving the slides, but if we could go to the motion piece. Um, the Typically in the motion, we include an expense reduction I mean, maybe to your point, Kevin, if we don't change the NPR, that piece is irrelevant. But if we did change the NPR, and I, I guess we could talk about this when it comes up further, I just wanted to pose the question. Like, does it make sense to require that or does it make sense to give the hospital more flexibility in this particular circumstance? And again, to your point, Kevin, if we don't change NPR, it doesn't matter. Well, in some respects, it matters because we would still hope that they would uh, strive to uh, keep expenses um, as low as possible. And I think they do that as a matter of course. Um, so I guess the, the appropriate question here is, does anyone think that Southwestern is an easy decision point that they could make any particular motion on at this point, or should we just go to the next hospital? I guess I would say um, I think that I, I'm in favor of approving the budget as submitted, um, so I could make that decision today. I think the team submitted a pretty conservative budget. I actually applaud them for that. I think this may surprise people. I think they could have potentially budgeted for more NPR. Um, that was actually trying what I was, some of my questions were about because their projections for 2021 grew between submission and hearing. If that volume continues, I think they may exceed the budgeted NPR. Um, they were, you know, budgeting a decline in inpatient and ED volume, but it looks like that's coming back. You know, they didn't include volume for new hires. So I think it was a very conservative budget in my mind with the potential upside of even more NPR. Um, but at the end of the day, I appreciated the conservative approach that they took because it also means they took a conservative approaches to expenses. And I think that's one of the reasons that SBMC is as successfully managed as it is. Um, and why they continually generate positive operating margins. So, you know, I'm I'm content with uh, approving the budget as submitted. 
Um, and in particular, that chart looking at the three and a half percent growth from 2019 is compelling to me. They're they're well under that uh, with their you know submitted budget. I do think, given where we are now, and I know it's different from uh, the circumstances are different now than when they submitted the budget back in June, but I think there's even potential room for more NPR that might come in. Uh, and I think at some point, not for today, we do have to think about what we're going to do with with enforcement for this budget cycle if we're going to do it or not given all the uncertainties but i will hold that conversation for a different day but i'm comfortable approving the budget as it was submitted other board members <clears throat> well i'm 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 fine with it too i mean I, I look at their npr trend since 2019 and it's well below our three and a half percent uh a threshold um, and uh, you know I look at their uh, participation in in the uh, value-based programs and they're I think the best in the state and they are also uh, can show that they're you know they're um, <clears throat> they're doing well with that in terms of transitioning their inpatient population to an outpatient population so I'm I'm happy with them um, I will say that since uh, the slide deck arrived yesterday, um, a little afternoon, that for me to kind of go through the slide deck, um, worry, which I mentioned earlier, a couple of things that I'd like to see, you know, to give context to all the 14 hospitals. And then um, looking at voting today, um, I'm, I'm not prepared to go beyond Northeastern. <laughs> so I just raise that red flag because that's as far as I've gotten in terms of kind of going back and thinking about, um, you know, you know, wh where, where I'm at on, on individual hospitals, but where I'm at on this hospital is a thumbs up. Yeah, I don't think that uh, any board member should feel uh, pressured to uh, vote on anything today. Um, just trying to take off anything off the table that we can take off, Tom. Yeah, yeah, I'm 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 fine with uh, Southwestern. They do a great is there, job. Is there any contrarian point of view on Southwestern? No, I'm I'm okay as well. You know, I would say that their rate request is higher than what we, you know, had um, put in at a 4.8. But the fact that they came in at a 3.5 last year and didn't have any, you know. They they came in um, per our request last year with the three and a half on their rate increase um, has allowed me to feel comfortable with their 4.8 this year. And I agree with what Jess is saying on their NPR. You know, they're below that three and a half percent trend when you go out the three years. Uh, they talked about beating this year. Um, and so, you know, I, I also think, you know, their age of plant is on the older side. Their cash, I can't even look at because it doesn't really reflect their cash because of the parent <laughs> corporation, but they're they're up a little bit higher than they were before, you know, and they did get, um, you know, over $15 million of, of COVID money, um, you know, that's that's supported them. But I, I can support this and go forward with this recommendation. And I'm I'm good as well when I looked at their um, change in charge and and the five year average, even adding in the higher change in charge, the average is still in the three point four uh, range. So uh, I'm comfortable. Should I make a motion? It would be appropriate. I moved that. I move to approve Southwestern Vermont Medical Center's budget as submitted with a 6.3% increase from fiscal year 2021 to fiscal year 2022 budgeted NPR FPP, a 4.8% increase to overall charges and subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined on slide 34. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to um, Approve Southwestern Vermont Medical Center's budget as outlined here on slide 42. Well, as modified by what Robin just said. Um, and is there any board discussion before I go to public comment? Hearing none, does any member of the public wish to comment on Southwestern Vermont Medical Center 
and the proposed motion in front of us for approval. Mike Del Treco. Good morning, uh, Kevin and board members. Um, I have a, I'm not sure, this isn't public comment specific to SVMC. We've moved from sort of SVMC specific discussion to more generalized budget hearing order conversation. So mine is more general in nature. Do you, do you want me to hold my comment until after you vote or do you want me to do it now? Go ahead and do it now. Okay, great. So, so as we move through um, the the process, I really want to have a, a few comments on what I've heard so far and where where we are. First of all, I want to acknowledge uh, each and every one of you. It's really this is really hard work, um, not easy, and sometimes from where I sit, it's um, it, it's easier to listen than than deliberate as you do uh, real time. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. So on slide six, uh, as Patrick went through his um, process, I really want to emphasize in our Patrick, continued- Patrick, can you go back to slide six? Certainly. Sorry, Mike. No, no problem at all, thanks. I just want to emphasize our continued capacity challenges, our workforce pressures, our inflationary pressures, um, the increased clinical intensity, and you've heard this all during the hospital hearings. And, and, and as you just mentioned, we're always managing our expansion, expenses. Um, to what looks like from the outside in the most recent conversation, what might be considered as um, not, not clear of why changes are happening on rate expenses or changes to expenses or net, net NPR and FPP. Um, is not very clear and I and I just think we need to understand and how you rationalize those decisions as you move move forward. Um, as I see these budgets, every dollar is necessary because of um, these um, really difficult circumstances and the lack of understanding what might happen in the future. Um, in Maureen's balance sheet conversation, I think to look at cash is important. You know, you you know, finance people say cash is king. Um, I don't disagree with that, but I also think it has to be taken in stride with other exposures such as risk, capital needs necessary to support community mission, um, relief funding reconciliations that are a complete disaster as we speak, and maybe most importantly, the great uncertainty to um, future public health needs. It's we are in a very, very tenuous situation, and I think these, you know, these things need to be considered as well as just an absolute cash number. Um, and then finally, I know you approved a new condition, um, and and it makes sense, and it's a very important part of reform to look at um, avoidable admissions and all of the things that we need to do to have healthy um, coordination of care and handoffs, patient care handoffs. I I think to have new conditions as part of 2022 budget orders are difficult, especially when we have, we, uh, Vaz, that represents the hospital members here, have very little time to consider and opine on those things. Um, I just wanna know how we might manage that as we go forward. So um, really hard job, and I, and I wanna reemphasize that I understand your the challenges of doing this stuff real time. So uh, those are my comments and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Mike. Is there other public comment? And Patrick, if you could go back to the slide with the motion language while we're uh, waiting to see if there's any other public comment. Hearing none, is there any further discussion by the board on Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and the motion in front of us? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. And any time that, uh, um, in this case, it was let the record show that it was unanimous vote. Any time that it is less than unanimous because we are doing this online, I will ask um, uh, the general counsel or one of the lawyers to uh, call the roll. So, um, 
let the record show that the board just approved the motion for Southwestern Vermont Medical Center, and we will now proceed to the next hospital and turning it back over to you, Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Kate Hoffman to discuss Rutland Regional Medical Center. And Kate, before you start, I would say uh, probably adjust your strategy here from just a review to um, navigating towards that recommendation if that impacts the way you're going to present Rutland. Um, because as I understand it, Mr. Chair, we're going to take these hospital by hospital and the board will either discuss for a potential vote or we'll move on. Is that correct? I just think that makes the most sense and anybody uh, on the board can object to that. But um, I like to have information um, fresh in my mind and I don't think jumping back and forth makes a lot of sense. So unless a, a board member objects, I think that uh, if there is reason to proceed with a particular budget while we're speaking about that hospital, we should. Um, obviously, um, Tom has already expressed some reservations about um, doing some votes. And I think that at any point on any one of these hospitals, if even one board member um, would like additional time, I think we should respect that. So um, with that, we'll go to Kate. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Patrick. Um, so we're going to take a look here at Rutland Regional Medical Center. So just to start off, their budget to projection variance for fiscal year 21 is about 7.8%. Um, their budget was very conservative in 21, um, which drives the budget to budget NPR variance to 9.2, but budget to projection is only 1.3, as you can see in the top left-hand corner of this slide. Um, the requested overall charge master increase is 3.64%, um, which you can see is coming from commercial and self-pay um, slash other. Um, again, as Patrick discussed on um, this new graph in the bottom left-hand corner here, you can see that um, Rutland's performance and trending information is pretty far below where they are trending at 3.5% as of the 2019 actuals. Um, other justifications from the hospitals, which we heard from most um, with the staffing issues and challenges, including the costly travelers, um, increased utilization is offsetting inflationary factors and in driving their um, NPR FPP increase. Um, their financial stability is keeping their rate request low. Um, they're utilizing participation in the ACO to better align their services, and they also echoed um, difficulty in creating the budget as the base is uncredible. And next slide, please. So their NPR is set to increase about $22.9 million with major drivers in utilization of about $11.6 million, um, about $4.8 million for reimbursement um, paramix changes, um, $4.5 million for their rate effect, and $3.1 million for changes in accounting, which is due to um, a revenue recognition change. And then, of course, there's a little bit of offsetting there in the left um, for bad debt and free care. Um, the next slide discusses their operating expenses. As you can see, there's a lot going on on this one compared to NPR. Um, their operating expenses are increasing about $24 million. Um, the major drivers, just I'll sh discuss here, um, is $9.3 million of inflation. Um, about 3.4 million associated with um, travelers, uh, 3.4 million related to fringe benefits, um, drugs of about 1.9 million, and then the resulting provider tax change of about 1.6 million, and IT of about 1.4 million. Um, next on their um, quarterly performance, um, which we can see here, they've been pretty um, consistent across the map, but as of projected the fourth quarter, they're declining a bit there. You can see the negative 5.9%. Um, they are still projecting an operating gain for the year, which is about $6 million. So pretty strong performance considering the unknowns of fiscal 2021. Um, 
Related to their historical performance, uh, this hospital exceeded their budgets in 2016 and 2018 and are projected to do so in 21, which as we discussed earlier, they had a very conservative budget in 21. Um, they have been realizing a nearly break even operating margin for 2018, 2019 um, and 2020. And also in the 2022 budget, sorry, that's a lot of 20s. Um, and then in the projection for 21, they are looking like they're gonna have a positive op operating margin as we looked at on the previous slide um, due to increased volumes in utilization. Um, next slide, please, Patrick. Um, so slide 48 breaks out their charge request as Patrick was talking about. So their overall charge request of 3.64%. Um, the NPR due to the change in charge is just over $4.5 million, giving them a 1% value of change in charge at about 1.2 million. Um, as you can see with the service category, um, all three are being impacted. Um, hospital inpatient being about 4%, outpatient about 4.2, and then professional services down a bit by 0.3%. Um, the pair, again, um, as we showed on the first slide, we see this changing in commercial and self-pay other, um, commercial being about 4.4 million, and then the self-pay um, just over 100,000. Um, their change in their NPR FPP is about $22.9 million, and of that, um, about 4.5 is derived from their, um, from their change in charge. Um, next slide, please. Um, so as Patrick was talking about as well, um, this slide shows the net revenue collection rates um, for all pairs in that line that goes across in the left hand graph. Um, you can see it's slightly declining from 43 to 42 percent in the 2022 budget. Um, we also see some slight variation in their payer mix to commercial and self-pay from the 21 projection, um, but a little bit of a bigger shift to Medicare from the FY21 budget. And on slide 50, so again, Patrick discussed earlier, we mistakenly say that um, they're within the growth rate guidance, or we, we had said that, I believe it's changed here. Um, so we are suggesting that they are approved as submitted for their 9.2 request um, in NPR FPP, which is 9% um, with the COVID allowance. And we also are suggesting to approve a submitted for their change in charge request of 3.64%. And again, the motion language is in the bottom. So board members, um, does anyone um, have any uh, reservations about discussing Rutland at this time? Hearing none, I'll open it up for board member comments or questions to Kate. Sure, I'll just throw out um, some comments. I'm not going to um, put forward a motion yet at this point, but just, just getting some background. Um, so this is a hospital that, that has seen um, a significant growth um, in their cash. So if we look at 2019, they were 10 million, 2020, 54 million, 21, 50 million, and the 22 budget looking at 23.5 million, which, which would then um, reflect what they're assuming they're going to be able to recoup from um, all the COVID money and the money they have to pay back. Um, the other thing I just want to put out there on the table, and I will bring this up for each of the hospitals that um, that there was a consideration for this for last year, which is last year we approved a 6% rate for this hospital. And although we did approve it at a full 6% rate in our discussions last year, 
We talked about, um, you know, bifurcating the rate for the COVID piece, if you will, um, but felt that if we put the rates out that way, then may put them at risk for uh, being able to keep all of the COVID money that they had received. So their rate last year was 6% and we had it split at 4% and 2%. So 2% we were thinking about possibly having as a temporary rate to help them through with COVID and with all the uncertainty. Um, and so the question I have and I will bring up on some of the hospitals is, you know, how do we want to think about that? Do we want to roll that in at all? We now know, for instance, where their cash is going to be. So they they are do have a much stronger balance sheet. Um, in addition, their forecast for 22, uh, for I'm sorry, for 21, their budget was uh, to have a $10 million um, bottom line after everything, and they're coming in at about 23 million. And in, in 2020, so 2019, they came in at 6 million, 2020, they came in at 15 million, and the 21 projection is 23 million. So they have certainly um, benefited from the COVID money as they should, and, and that's helped you know keep them afloat. Um, so I just want to kind of put that out there. I'm not putting a solid recommendation right now. I think one, you know, just for perspective again, their rate request, so 1% in rate is worth 1.2 million. Again, their cash is up quite significantly. You know, do we do we consider that as we're going through this? So I just kind of wanted to get everybody's read on, on where they sit. You know, I agree their 3.64 request um, is not high. I'm just trying to put it in context of the prior year and some of the intent that we had, you know, potentially from last year, or at least, you know, that that's where um, we said we were going to potentially consider that um, this year. So just want to kind of put that out there, not putting out any formal formal motion language, but just want to get a read on where everyone sits. A uh, couple of one other couple other points I will make is Rutland, um, when you look at that commercial ratio um, that we talked about that would be on slide 49, um, they are at 2.1, uh, which is the highest of all hospitals except for UVM, which is at 2.34. So they, they have a real solid ratio between you know where they are pegged against Medicare. Um, and again, as we look at some hospitals that that may be uh, closer to Medicare, you know, it, it just should reflect some type of pricing there. Um, and then um, I think their four year average for commercial, if we accept this one is three point seven five. So just slightly over the three point five on an average. So that um, that sways things a little bit the other way, you know, in my mind. So I'll stop now and see what other comments. Be other members of the board. Uh, just a question to Maureen. I think that 3.7 over the four years includes um, uh, the 6% as opposed to the 4%. That's the way it I calculate it. Right. It does. It's the approved. So that helps sway it a little bit the other way because they have been low. In 2019, they had a 2.7%, 2020, 2.7, right. 21, 6, 22, 3.6. You right. know, I'm not saying I won't approve this as is. I just want to lay that out for people because I will, we, you know, I know last year under testimony, I said, I will consider that next year. We were asked in questioning and I said, you know, that will be a consideration for me next year for some of the higher rates. Um, but you're right, Tom, the 3.75 includes the yep. six. And I think you made some valid points, Maureen, but I look at that operating margin that's just above zero and that has some major concerns. This is one where I think expenses are, are uh, really the key discussion point for them as they're making decisions, not so much for us, but um, you know, the, the fact that they don't have an operating margin tends to 
concern me if we were to make a cut, but. But they do have a total margin. And, you know, this is a hospital that has had a, they have a total margin in, um, of 2.2, but in this current year, they're projecting 7.3, um, and in 20, it was 5.2. So they, they do have a, a total margin um, at the hospital. So an, another factor just that we should be considering. Yep. Other board members? Well, yeah. I, I, go ahead, go ahead. I, I was just struck uh, in the hearings um, you know that that the fact that they have no margin um, operating margin is a choice they made a choice and um, you know that choice was to try to keep their charge as low as possible in order to kind of uh, add cohesion to the overall health care infrastructure in the Rutland area which I thought was a kind of a noble uh, choice to make um, and uh, that you know they basically expressed that there's a lot of uncertainty uh, and a lot of kind of opportunity for, you know, continuing opportunity to have the uh, uh, Rutland providers uh, better aligned. And so they wanted to, given the, their strong cast position and, and balance, balance sheet, they wanted to take the time to and, and have a message uh, of, um, you know, cohesiveness across their provider network. So. I, I, you know, I, I kind of look at their margin a little differently here um, in that that they they chose that they could have come in looking for and I suggested that um, not, not that they do it, but I I raise the issue. Why don't you come in with a little bit more so that you can add a little bit positive margin? And um, they they were very clear that that's that's a choice they wanted to make. So I, I'm not going to fight with them over that. OK, Robin. Yeah, I am. Um, I appreciate um, what Maureen says, and certainly last year, I think I, I definitely was interested in looking at kind of this offsetting effect. I have to admit that I was hopeful last year that we would be a little bit farther along to done with the pandemic, um, and so that the current pandemic situation does change the way I look at it. Um, because I think there continues to be uncertainty now. And, um, you know, I think we're still in the middle of, of uncertainty around utilization and uncertainty around um, staffing and expenses are a, a very big concern. So, um, so I, I think it is, for me, it's important to look back to last year and what we approved and how that fits in. But I think what I may, where I may land on that, given all of the current COVID situation, is to um, think about how we continue in the future to incorporate that look back into future budgets so that when we eventually get back to something resembling normalcy, um, you know, that when there's less uncertainty, perhaps, you know, that would be up the time to to push back on that. And I, I do I do have concerns about Rutland being a relatively more expensive for commercial payers hospital in Vermont. Um, but I also think that they have done a good job in the past of coming in with rate decreases when their utilization has run hot and, and really tried to live within the guidance. So um so those considerations, as well as um, the financial metrics and what Kevin was saying about operating margin, all of those different things, I think where I probably would land with Rutland would be comfortable approving them as submitted, given their NPR relative to the five years and um, and um, kind of the COVID situation. So I guess I'm last, um, and I'm probably going to be generally in agreement with others. Um, and I always appreciate Maureen's perspective on this and others' perspectives on this. And I share some of those concerns around where the relative commercial rate is relative to Medicare. Uh, but at this point, I, I'm in favor of approving this budget as submitted. I think the budget at NPR is below that annualized 3.5% growth rate since 2019. 
the 3.64 change in charge request is is reasonable in my mind, given the inflationary pressures that I think these hospitals are under and potentially going to be under even more so as the labor market uh, you know heats up and we don't you know we've got an even greater shortage. Um, it's also I want to remember that 3.64 is pretty close to what we allowed in our presumptive budget approval, which was 3.5. So given that, um, you know, I feel like that's what we actually articulated to all the hospitals. If they came in under 3.5, we would presumptively approve if their NPR was also under 3.5. So 3.64 is pretty close to that. Uh, the the they also you know if you look at the five year average, it's they're at about 2.2%. So I think we've slowed through some of our uh, approved commercial rates for Rutland, perhaps slowed some of that, um, you know, the commercial to Medicare growth rate potentially. Uh, it's something that I think through our sustainability planning efforts, we'll have a better understanding of price variation across hospitals when the when that data is completed and submitted to the board and presented to the board. I would also say that that rate that they're asking for it does generate a 0% operating margin, which they can do, as Maureen says, because of their strong financial position. Um, it may, in fact, be, uh, they may have, I, I think they may be like Southwest, they may have a conservative budget here. Uh, I would not be surprised if their NPR exceeds what they're projecting if volumes keep up and, frankly, if they need to accommodate the excess demand coming down from Chittenden County. So um, at this point, you know, although I wish that their in general their commercial rate was a little bit lower relative to Medicare, uh, I'm comfortable with approving this budget. And um, just a, as a point of reference, can the staff remind us? Um, my recollection is that they came in last year um, with a reduced NPR. Is that correct? I believe so. That is correct. Yeah, significantly reduced NPR. So I think you really do have to look at uh, a multi-year look. That 9.2 sounds very onerous, but I'm not I'm not sure that it's reflective of uh, what it could have been if someone had just uh, come in under the guidance uh, last year. Here we go. Does anybody wish to make a motion at this time, or would you like to go to the next hospital? I think we can go, to, we can continue with this hospital. And, and, you know, I just wanted to be clear, you know, especially because we do this in public, um, you know, I just wanted to be transparent about the different things I was going to look at, but intentionally I didn't say, you know, whether I would make an adjustment to change in charge or not, and I am willing to, um, accept this uh, budget as presented um, because I think they have been, you know, thoughtful in the past about their change in charge requests. Um, but I'll let Robin make the motion. She's so good at that. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Uh, I move we approve Rutland Regional Medical Center's budget as submitted with a 9.2 percent increase from fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 22 budget at NPR FPP. A six, a, excuse me, 3.64 percent increased overall charges and subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined on slide 34. Second. Is there a second? Okay. Further board discussion? If not, at this point in time, I'll open it up for public comment on the motion regarding Rutland Regional Medical Center's budget. Is there any public comment? And I see Eric Schulteis. Eric? Uh, hi, Chair Mullen. Um, I apologize for not raising this earlier. I was actually working writing on another project and I have difficulties multitasking while writing. Um, this is a general comment. I think in the future, um, if the board could just clarify um, its special public comment period for our hospital budgets, that would be helpful. So the first sentence uh, on the board's website reads that the special comment period runs from July 28th to September 1st. And then a few sentences later, last sentence, it says, please submit public comments prior to September 1st. 
to be considered by the board in deliberations. So I think what should have been said is at least for deliberations, which presumably is why you would want public comment would be it runs from July 28th through August 31st. Um, so the deadlines and um, what the word prior in the last sentence can lead to uh, it being a, a bit misleading. I mistakenly misread it myself and I imagine other people might too. Thank you. I totally agree with you, Eric, and we'll make sure that doesn't happen again in the future. August 30th should have been the date. Thank you so much. Is there any public comment on the motion for Rutland Regional Medical Center? If not, is there any further board discussion? Hearing none, the motion in front of us is to approve Rutland Regional Medical Center's budget as submitted with a 9.2% increase from fiscal year 21 to 22 budgeted NPR FPP and a 3.64% increase in overall charges and subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined on slide 34. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the board unanimously approved the motion regarding Rutland Regional Medical Center's budget. And at this point, I'll turn it back to Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, next on the docket here is going to be Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital, and Lori Perry will be addressing this organization. Lori, over to you. Before Lori starts, Tom, did you say that um, you were good through Northeastern? And after that, uh, we should uh, um, wait till Friday, or let, I just want to clarify. Well, I, um, I'm caught the twist in between here. I, I kind of went back and, and reviewed all my no notes and everything for today through Northeastern. I, I didn't really know when, when I got the slide deck, you know, which hospitals would be the first six. Um, and so, um, so for clarification, is it alphabetical through Northeastern or is it these three? Tom. Say it again. Is it alphabetical? Did you go through each hospital alphabetically through Northeastern? No. Or was no, it just, just these three? Uh, it was just these three. Um, okay. Yeah, but that's but fine. That, I don't I don't think anybody should be pressured into uh rushing uh, up a decision. So um, so it sounds like this will be the last one unless uh, I hear differently, um, Patrick. So after this one, you can just proceed through the rest. But Kevin, can oh. I can make a suggestion? Um, I just throw out there. I'm, I'm not sure how beneficial it is to go through the rest of the slides um, if we're not, I mean, I, my preference would be to do it like when we're gonna re review that budget. So, you know, to me, it's just, a, we'll be going through, you know, 60 or 70 slides without having the recommendations. Um, I mean, I would have preferred to go through the six that they did do the recommendations and and um, maybe Tom would feel comfortable on some, maybe not, and that's fine. But going beyond that um, and love the uh, rest of the board's perspective if, if they think it's beneficial, you know, to me, I think it's this is well set up. I think it's very helpful to go through each one. Um, but if we're not going to deliberate on them and make that decision, um, not sure what the benefit is. But that's that's my point of view. So, Patrick, other than um, the the three that conversations have begun to uh, take place, Southwestern, um, Rutland, and Northeastern. What are the other three that? you believe um, could be tackled today? I believe we have Mount Escutney, North Country Hospital, and Grace Cottage. Perhaps, Tom, we could take a little bit longer break at lunchtime, and you might be able to uh, look at those three, and then we could come back uh, this afternoon and uh, proceed. 
So unless there's objection, I think we should proceed through um, Northeastern because everybody seems to be ready for that. Listen to uh, Lori's presentation, have a discussion on that. And then I would suggest that we take a, a little bit longer than planned lunchtime and Tom, you can let us know when we come back if you're um, what you're prepared for, and uh, we can move from there. Well, thank you for that, Kevin. I, I think I'll be prepared. The, the only, you know, Grace Cottage and Mount of Scutney, I, I, I'm, uh, I have a pretty good feeling about. It would be North Country that I'd want to revisit again. Just, uh, um, but I, I, I think I can do that. Okay. And again, don't feel pressured. If you're not ready, we, we no, won't. I know. Okay. I know. I've had to say no before in my life. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Lori? I, I don't I don't want to say no here though, but okay. Thank you. Thank you, you're Mr. Welcome. Chair. Um, this is Northwest Northeastern Regional Hospitals budget and um for their fiscal year twenty one budget two projection variance, it was three point five percent. Their budget was over 90 million point five, and their projection is 93.7 million. They are requesting 97.4 million or 97,368,788. This is 7.6% over their 21 budget, and it's 3.9% over their 21 projection. The 7.6% request is higher than our 3.5% growth rate guidance. And with looking at their trend for the 3.5%, they are um, projected to be uh, budgeting to be higher than what we're trending for the 3.5%. Um, they are asking for 3% overall change in charge and this is composed of commercial at $1.2 million and self-pay at just shy of $50,000. Um, we heard from the hospital that they justify this budget being because they're at or above capacity and they have significant inflation pressures. They are expanding and adding services to their community. Their price comparison analysis determine overall change in charge increase. They look at it and that they need an overall change in charge increase. Their volumes are expected to return to pre-COVID, which is 2019. And the they are continuing to offset or continuing to reduce their avoidable ED utilization. And we also know that they have a, an express care at their hospital. Um, this hospital is increasing 6.8% from the 21 approved budget to the uh, 22 budget. And the major drivers are their rate at 1.2 million. Utilization is 1.6 million. They are having an improvement in their bad debt and free care of 1.1 million. And they expect to increase FPP by about 700,000. And then their new and expanded services are about 1.5 million of their NPR FPP drivers. For their expenses, this hospital is, next slide please, thank you. Their expenses are increasing 6.3 million from their budget 21. And these are mainly through inflation of 2.1 million. Those new and expanded services equal 1.6 million. They are expecting new positions of about $700,000, and they are budgeting a decrease in travelers of one and a half million. Um, the next slide, please. Their operating performance for NPR FPP. This hospital has been pretty steady throughout the quarters. And um, 20 in for fiscal year 21, and their operating margins are also very well. This hospital is pretty much through all the years that we've been also reviewing have had positive operating margins, so they're a steady hospital. Um, they are projecting for NPR for their 
last quarter to be 2.9% over their third quarter. Uh, next slide, please. For their historical performance, um, NVRH has exceeded their budgets for every year except for 2017. This hospital has consistently had positive operating margins between 1.3% and 2% and from the years 2016 to 22. So this is a very steady hospital and um, hopefully it continues. Um, next slide, please. The change in charge for this hospital is 3% and it is about $1.2 million of their NPR. And for their 1% value of change in charge, it's about $400,000. And they're splitting this um, evenly for outpatient and um, inpatient gross charges and nothing for all the others. And as stated from the other um, slide, their payer mix is going to be mainly for a commercial of $1.1 million and then only $47,900 for self pay and other. Their NPR FPP change is the $6.8 million. And again, the change in charge makes up $1.2 million. This hospital has requested on average 3.9% and have been approved at 3.4% on a five-year average. For their collection rate, this hospital has been pretty steady from 2017 to 22 at about 49 to 48%. And also their payers have been remaining about steady. On their payer mix, NPR FPP mix, this has um, shifted a bit between commercial and Medicaid for between 2020 and 2022. So like in commercial in 2020, it was 49%. Now they're going to 47. And um, for their um, Medicaid, it was 13%. Now it's 16%. What Medicare looks to be about pretty even. Next slide, please. So this hospital, we recommend to approve as submitted. They are at their NPR FPP uh, growth is 7.6% and it does exceed the budget growth rate guidance. And with the COVID allowance, it's at 7.1%. And then the change in charge is 3%. So, Mr. Chair, if I may jump in just for a um, correction to the record here, I think on slide 52, when Lori was discussing NPR, she noted that their NPR was growing 6.8%. <clears throat> it's growing $6.8 million over prior budget, which would be 7.6% budget to budget. So I just want to make that correction for the record. Thank you, Patrick. Certainly. OK, board members, do you have questions for Lori or comments on the Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospitals uh, budget? Uh, sure, I can start. First, Lori, can you go to page 56? Uh, what I just want to point out here is the, the um, question I was asking about Southwestern at the beginning. And again, maybe they have no professional, but what this shows is hospital inpatient at 3-4, outpatient at 3-4, all other zero, and overall change in charge of three. Um, and I'm fine with that. I just want to point that out because when you look at Southwestern, they had 4.8, 4.8, zero, and then they still had 4.8 for their overall change in charge. So um, it is something as we're going through the hospitals, we should clarify because we may be approving a lower charge again for instance, on Southwestern, when you look at it the same way as we are here. So just wanted to specifically show what I meant when I was talking about Southwestern earlier. Um, on, on this budget, um, I'll start by saying I'm, I'm OK with this one and, and moving forward with it. But I will uh, just make a couple comments on, on some of the things I've been commenting on on the other hospitals. Um, 
This is one of the lower hospitals when you go to page 57 and look at that comparison between the commercial and Medicare um, at that 58 to 41 is a 1.4. So when we looked just at Rutland, which is a 2.1, you know, so their relationship um, is a lot tighter. Again, we have different kinds of types of hospitals and different way of pricing, but you know, that's important to look at that. Um, they did not get a temporary rate last year. So it was not requested, nor did they get a temporary rate. Um, and they have seen um, quite an improvement in their cash balances, um, but their day's cash on hand is not is not huge, but they have gone from 5.8 in 2019 um, to uh, a high of 29 million in 20 and a 22 budget of 13.4. So, you know, I think their balance sheet is looking a lot stronger, which is 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 healthy. Um, and you know, this is obviously one of the hospitals at the border, so it's always hard to decipher, you know, when they've had changes from people from New Hampshire coming in or out, um, but I am fine with approving it as submitted. Other board members? This is Robin, I can jump in. Um, I am also fine with approving it as submitted, although I will note that, um, you know, I think one of the issues with this hospital for me has been a multi-year concern about their utilization. Their change in charges have been steadily fairly low, but their utilization has been steadily over, their NPR uh, has steadily been over 3.5% driven by utilization. Um, and because they are a border hospital and frequently anecdotally cite to New Hampshire or out of state residents, I did look back at the patient origin analysis. Now, granted, that is uh, only through 2018, but if you look at that data, it's pretty consistent that there are episodes from inpatient for out of state tend to run in the teens, and their and their episodes for outpatient tend to be around 1,000, uh, dropping down to 900 and something in some years, or up to about 1,100 in others. But I'm, at least in the prior data, it looks pretty consistent and it doesn't, I'm not seeing what they're saying anecdotally. So um, I just wanted to say that out loud, because, again, because we are currently in a pandemic that is gonna shape many of my decisions this year. Um, but this is an ongoing concern that I just want to put out there because eventually, you know, I'm going to be looking for Northeastern to have either better data on the out of state um, utilization and how that is impacting NPR or better explanations about why their utilization um, is consistently uh, above the guidance. But this year, pandemic, I'll let it go. I, I can go then. Um, so I'm 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 happy to approve this budget as submitted as well. Uh, I think the three percent change in charge master increase is reasonable given the inflationary pressures that we know hospitals are under. Particularly, also we know it was below our presumptive approval of three point five, and their five year average is also below that three point five. So the change in charge I think was reasonable. Um, I have some concerns about the NPR request, the growth rate in it, the 7.6 budget to budget. If you look at that chart, Patrick, where the 3.5 annualized growth would have been, yeah, we had it there. Oops, sorry. Yeah. So you look at the orange line, that would have been the 3.5% trending. This is going to be above that. Um, so again, to Robin's points about utilization, where is it coming from? Uh, this is one of the hospitals that, you know, on the on the potentially avoidable utilization was high, but I also very much appreciated that they are recognizing that they're starting to track that and they're starting to do something about that. It was the only hospital I think that mentioned that they were indeed tracking it and trying to work towards that. So 
I guess I would echo Robin's concerns about the utilization. Where is it coming from? Document it. If it's coming from New Hampshire, um, if it's, you know, if it's growing from New Hampshire, that's one thing. Um, but I'm also appreciative of the fact that they are working towards reducing some of their avoidable utilization. So I guess I would say just to make sure that they end up with a margin, that they're not over projecting um, NPR growth for next year, budget to budget. My hope would be that if quarter one and quarter two starts to slow down and the pent up demand is, you know, kind of has been met, that they will reduce their operating expenses um, so they can ensure that there's a margin at the end of the year. But I am comfortable with approving the margin, I mean, the budget as it stands. Um, that's true for me as well. I um, The only uh, kind of uh, orange, flashing orange I had on this budget and going through it was that um, their um, FFP as a percent of uh, uh, NPR FFP is only at 9.3%. Um, and kind of looking at the growth in Medicaid, uh, I think some of that has to do um, with with the, the uh, movement to ex the expanded me Medicaid um, uh, a, a, a approach to, uh, um, um, I'm blanking out the word, contributive lives. But I, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, it, um, so that that's my feeling about it is is that you know they're, they're looking at an 11 percent increase in 22 budget over 22 projected in Medicaid. I think that might little be a little steep in that the the prior increases have been uh, I think attributable more to a change in methodology uh, than a, a, a change in underlying population. But that all that said, um, you know I I can support this budget. Is anyone prepared to make a motion? I will move that we approve Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital's budget as submitted with a 7.6% increase from fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 22 budgeted NPR FPP, a 3% standard increase to overall charges and subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined in slide 34. Second. Is there a second? I heard a second from member Holmes. Is there further board discussion? If not, I'll open it up for public comment on the Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital budget uh, motion that's in front of us. Is there any member of the public who wishes to comment at this time? Hearing none, I'll return back to the board discussion. Is there any further discussion by the board? If not, the motion before us is to approve Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital budget as submitted with a 7.6% increase from 21 to 22 budgeted NPR FPP and a 3% standard increase to overall charges and subject to the standard budget conditions as outlined on slide 34. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record show that uh, the board unanimously approved Northeastern Vermont's uh, budget. And at this time, um, it seems logical to take that extended lunch break to give um, board members some time to be prepared on the, the uh, next three. Um, so uh, I'll put this meeting in recess. I believe that the agenda called for a 135 start time. So this meeting will be in recess until 135 and will commence at that time. Thank you, everyone.